So John chapter 6, notice with me, I want to read verse 37 as we go. And this is Jesus speaking or praying. And you have the dissertation on the bread of life. And as he's down, working his way down through, he's speaking to his father. This is Christ. Uh, some Bibles will have this in red because Jesus is speaking here. And notice with me verse 36. I'm in John chapter 6 and verse, uh, verse 37. And it says here, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So we see here, drop down to verse 47. It says, Verily, verily, in conclusion of what he's stating here, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You say, what is he saying here? He's praying to the Father and he's stating that those that the Father hath given him, uh, his disciples and those that have believed on him, he keeps and he gives them everlasting life. You get into the argument of, well, when does that everlasting life start? Once you die physically and you're in heaven and that's where it starts. According to scripture and how it states, it is, starts immediately upon salvation. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is the sealing and he seals you. And the, vibe, the Bible is very clear on that. So in point one, here's what we stated. We're going to get to point three quickly. But point number one in our lesson, and this is kind of backtracking a little bit, our eternal security rests in the promises and the strength of Jesus Christ. And we started with John chapter 6, which we read. We use that as our springboard. You have John chapter 10. And we read John chapter 10 last week in our class in the back. And John chapter 10, and uh, if you look at verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And he says in verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is a doctrine that was started by Jesus Christ. It's not something that... Uh, you have other disciples. This is Jesus Christ teaching the disciples or the apostles. And so uh, it's very important. I've run across brethren and sisters, probably of different denominations more than likely, but they've made the emphatical statement saying, I only believe the words that are written in red. So well, what about Paul's gospel to the church? They said, I don't... <laughs> I don't like Paul, number one, because of what he states about the church, but that's his hearsay. That's just kind of what he wanted put in the Bible. It's not, it's not. I said, so basically you believe in partial inspiration. Yes, that's it. That's it, the lady said. Yes, I believe in partial, partial inspiration, which only the words in red are inspired because they're God's words. So... Um, of course, she didn't believe in this doctrine, although it's, it's, in, it's in red, and Jesus Christ is teaching it very plainly. You cannot write it more plainly than, the, than what is written here. So we looked at John chapter 10, and then we got to our second point, and our second point in this is, and I, I challenge our disciples, our disciples to write this outline in the book, in your Bible. And I, I won't, for, for the sake of embarrassing somebody, but besides Brother Samuel, Brother Matt, and Pastor here, if I had a show of hands, could you show me three verses on eternal security? How many hands would go up? Okay? So this is why you want to have this down. This is a very sure doctrine. And number one is the doctrine taught by Christ. And we're saying, secondly, here's the second point. If you are writing down, and these notes are readily available, generally every Everybody in my class gets this lesson, each lesson, and the next one we'll teach on will be baptism, and we just go through the basic doctrines, walk our way through them. We, you just happen to catch us in lesson number three. But the second point in lesson number three is our eternal security is the gift of God, not a works of man, not by works of man. Our salvation and our eternal security go hand in hand. The two cannot be separated. Without salvation, there is no everlasting life. If you understand the doctrine of salvation, 
then the two are, are together, okay? So you have to understand that. Uh, there would be no eternal security. Our eternal security is a result of our salvation, and it is the gift of God. All right, so uh, we cannot lose what we could not earn. We cannot keep what we were not ever able to gain on our own. You say, how do, how do you prove that statement? I prove it by Galatians chapter 3, one through verses 1 through 3. The works of the flesh cannot perfect us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 through 10 says, We have nothing but to boast of. Nothing. He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what scriptures conclude about our salvation. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith. In that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That's where we get, it is a gift, just like in John 3, 16. And so you say, well, I already understand all that. But can, can, can you show it from scripture? Do you rest on scripture or what the pastor or preacher says or somebody told you? You need, to, you need to know this for yourself because it's going to fortify you when there's nobody else around. And when you have somebody maybe ask you a question about eternal security, about your salvation. And so it isn't that important. Then we say in point number three, and this is kind of where we had ended last week, kind of moving quickly through these points, we'll rest here. Our salvation, point number three now, our salvation and eternal security are set and sealed by God. Say, so how do we get to that? Well, in Romans chapter 8, he, he begins to break down, we are more than conquerors. How are we more than conquerors? Well, we understand by studying scripture that it's not our feet of, of strength. It's not in us. Although man will try to tell you what's well, in what you can do or what you can muster up or how strong you can be or what your, what your constitution consists of. Well, some people's constitution is very weak. Other people's, you know, medium. Other people's are very strong, have a strong constitution about themselves. That, that's, that's a philosophy. It happens to be true realistically, but the philosophy is, well, only people who have strong constitutions are therefore saved. That's it's wrong. The conclusion is wrong. It's not based out of Scripture. Uh, even the weakest person who just simply puts their faith and trust in Christ can be saved and enjoys everlasting life. You say, well, what if, what if you got a brother or sister who just simply doesn't believe that? Does it make them saved or lost? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's a, it's a promise of God, number one, as we're learning. Number two, it's secured in Christ. It's by Christ, Christ's strength. He keeps us and sustains us. This is the salvational part. Your, your, your walking, your relationship hinges on us. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Okay, so very carefully, you've got to be careful with understanding. It's why you want to understand the doctrine of not only salvation, but eternal security. And so uh, we teach a, I teach a series here, try to once a, once a year, standing in state. And I had just finished it. Well, actually, it's 2022. I haven't started it this year. Uh, welcome to 2022. <laughs> hey. But uh, we normally teach it once a year. Why? It's because the understanding, it's so... Uh, wonderful to understand your standing in your state. And, and people will have that confused, very easily confused. And they'll think, well, how I feel this day is, is, is based on, well, uh, my, my standing with Christ. Your standing with Christ hinges on God and what you've put your faith in. Your state hinges on how well you maintain that relationship with God. It can be very cold. If you're running from God, if you're not talking to God, if you're not in his word, if he's not allowing him to, to speak to you, if you're not praying and communicating with him, your relationship is cold. You can liken it to a marriage relationship. You can liken it to a relationship with not only a spouse, but with a, a child, with a father and a son, uh, or a father and a dollar, or a mother and a... You can liken to relationships. Your relationship will not stay strong if you do not communicate all right, so uh, you can liken it. I think what the Bible speaks of is the father and son. Luke chapter 15, he never, never loses his sonship. He loses a lot. He loses his relationship. He loses his fellowship. You know, he goes into a far country, but he never loses being the son of the, of, of the father. You never lose that. You know, in this world, you can do the same thing. Um, you can change your name legally. You can change your name. Today, I hate to say it, you can even change your sex from the appearance, the physical appearance. A lot of people get into that. I don't think it's biblical or right, but you can do that. They have ways of doing that today. You know, when though, even though you can change everything about you, 
And you still do a DNA and you'll still go back to your father and your mother. You're not ever going to change that. And that's, that's what Christ is likening this relationship with him, your salvation. It can't be changed because God is the one who does it. Um, it d- doesn't void the fact of relationship-wise, remitical. So let's get into some of these, these verses, and I want to end in point number three and four. So we're saying, thirdly, our salvation and eternal security are set and sealed by God. Salvation and eternal security are not uh, items that we physically possess as if we could somehow lose. Um, sometimes people are not in that context dealing with these phrases. They think it is a physical thing that they, a tangible, something that they hold on to. Uh, and so Romans chapter, let's get into this about being more than conquerors. Romans, I said we were going to go there here a few minutes ago. Romans chapter 8. Notice with me in verse 31 through 39, he says here, what shall we say then, uh, uh, what shall we say then, then say uh, to these things? And he's, he's concluded, and remember the book of Romans, when we get into Romans, our context dealing with this, the completion of the New Testament, salvation at the rapture. So he's teaching pretty heavy stuff here. And he says in verse uh, in verse 32, he that spareth not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Okay, he's going to get into the doctrine of justification, redemption, imputation, propitiation. All these will go or hinge on the doctrine of salvation. Now watch verse 34 and on. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. That's why pastor and many pastors will state who have a firm grip on this doctrine is that if you can lose this promise that God promises you everlasting life, the salvation, then Christ would fail at being an intercessor. That's what Christ does. He's the intercessor for us between you and God. He said there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. So this is Christ. This is his job. Now, upon salvation, he is the intercession for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? He begins to work, notice, in the physical realm. Now watch what happens. As it is written, now he's going to quote scripture, for, they, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. How, how can we state that we're saying our salvation and eternal security are set and sealed by God? By verses such as this, let's read on. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, now as he moves from the physical to the eternal, nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. So what he's speaking of is transcends time, the, the past, the present, and the future. Nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which, what, what love is he speaking of? In the same context, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is that? He came to this earth to die for the sins of the world. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. Consist of our gospel that we preach in this age. Uh, if you move on from Romans, I like Romans as one of, one of the powerful, steadfast verses or phrasing of verses for this doctrine. If you look, though, with me, turn over to 1 John. Now, head towards Revelations. 1 John is there, kind of up against Jude and Revelations. But 1 John chapter 5. Now, some of the, these verses we had went over last week. And uh, I encourage anybody that wants to be inside that, that type of discipleship class. It's, it's basic doctrine. A lot of times people coming into the church have questions uh, about, well, what do, you, what do you teach? How's this done? How's that? That's the class to be in. It's not going to be as deep as the first Peter, second Peter, as, as Brother Phil is teaching or pastor. Here, this is very simple stuff. You say, man, this is really complicated. This is very simple. 
So you calibrate yourself where this is simple. If you don't have this down and you're below that, that's fine. I'm not making fun of it, but you need, to, you need to come up. You need to begin to study the word of God. This is a simple doctrine. This has been around since the cross. Uh, so you say, well, this is really deep. This, <laughs> this is not deep. Uh, so let's, let's stick with it. Watch what 1 John chapter 5 states, verse 5, verse 11. He says here, and he's going to speak of a record, and there's a, a lot of good stuff here in 1 John chapter 5, but um, we're just going to look at 11 through 13. But he says this, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, and this is the record that God, so he's going to give us something that God had done, God hath given to us eternal life. There's the phrase again, you will find that eternal life, everlasting life through the New Testament. It is, it's not hidden. Uh, it's very prevalent. It's there. In this life, he's going to explain it. In this life is in his son. Well, I thought it was in something that we did. I thought it was in something that we held on to. It's not. It's, it's in his son, and it, Jesus Christ. Now watch this. It, he that hath the son hath life. Very simple, not complicated. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. This morning I could ask a simple question just by way of expounding Scripture. Have you believed on the Son of God? Probably most of us in here says, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, he's the Savior of the world. I need a Savior. So I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There are many people who do not. Don't let it shock you, but there are many people who do not. There are many religious people who do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All right? So he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He wants that reader, uh, as he writes this and records this by the Holy Spirit, to rest assured in what he's written that you can believe, you can trust on the Son of God. And so there's power that backs it. That's how we're able to say that. I want you to notice Ephesians, and I, and I spoke of this verse just, just real quickly, but I, I need to go back and expound or give the sense uh, of it as we're in this context. We're seeing our salvation and eternal security are set and sealed by God. Ephesians, now notice with me, chapter 1, and I want verses 13. Notice what he says here. Uh, this is a powerful chapter, and so as we look at the background and the order of our salvation, as we come down through verse 7 on down to verse 13, this is the context dealing with salvation. Now watch in verse 13, careful to keep our context, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. Now he's going to, this is another writer, but he's going to say the same thing, but he's going to give you even more. He's going to add to what, the, what John had written. Okay, and he says, he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your, he's going to give you even more context, the gospel of your salvation. So, so now you have, you have context of what he's talking about, and it's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, and it's about your salvation. That simple. Now let's read on. In whom also after that ye believed. You mean I work? I do. No. You, it's a simple believing. I like what they said to the Philippian jailer. He come in trembling and he fell down. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he says, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or believe on Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and he believed and he trusted and so we see here, so it's the same thing. In whom also ye, ye, ye also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed. After, after you were, you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So what about the individual who believed but didn't realize that, that the Holy Spirit seals them? What about that person? They're still sealed. <laughs> uh, the question, and I've, I've mentioned it here and probably said it months ago, a couple weeks ago, about a, a friend who actually passed on. And the, the man believed in Jesus Christ. He was of a different denomination, pr different persuasion, but he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and he put his faith in him. But his, his problem was he didn't know if he had done, you know, if that was just it. It was so simple. And he was struggled with eternal security. And the question that was put to me after he, was, after he had gone on to be with the Lord is, do you think that man was saved because he might not have believed in eternal security? I said, most definitely 
You don't have to believe in it to be saved. You have to believe in Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. Um, so, uh, so he said, yeah, most definitely. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know that I'm going to find out after, after I leave this earth and, and go to heaven. There's a lot of stuff. So it's not by default. I like what the Bible says. What if some did not believe? So not make this, this of none effect. It means it's void. No, the promises are God are still true. God cannot deny himself. And that you have to understand about salvation. And remember, I, I always say this when I teach and preach. How are you viewing these scriptures? Are you viewing it through the lens of man and how you think about it? Are you viewing this scripture by the lens of God and the scriptures? When you align yourself up with the word of God, you view these through the eyes how God's viewing it or has written it. That's why I'm saying once you get a grasp on salvation, you understand that salvation is a promise that God gives you. He's the one that cannot deny himself. It's a beautiful thing. You thought, wow, because when you really see yourself as being undone, being a sinner, uh, being uh, without any righteousness of yourself to obtain God's righteousness or appeasement, you begin to say, well, I, I couldn't do this on a stack of Bibles. Uh, if, 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 if I was the best person on earth, uh, I think even the Bible alludes to three people of their righteousness. If the righteousness of Daniel, the righteousness of there's two other men, and that's going to fail me. It might be Moses, uh, maybe Noah. There's three men he speaks of their righteousness, and he says they're not righteous enough. They missed the whole point. The righteousness has to come by God. And God said the only way you get my righteousness is through my son. So you have to understand this about salvation. It's a beautiful thing, and it gives you it gives you an assurance of this is the thing, this is a work, this is a keeping, this is a promise of God that cannot be broken. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, and so we're to teach this to, to one another. Those that don't know, it's to be taught. And so we must do this. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13 we read, so we see the sealing or the sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He even goes on to say, which is the earnest, look at verse 14, which is the earnest, that isn't the whole thing. You know what earnest is? We speak of earnest money. Now, there's been many times we saw a beautiful looking guitar at a pawn shop or maybe at a yard sale, more or less at a yard sale in that setting. And man, you just don't quite have the $500, but you give them a $50 bill, $100 bill, so I'll be back with the rest. And you give them an earnest. Might have been a car you looked at and you liked, and you put some earnest money down. And so uh, here he says, this is the Holy, the Holy Spirit of promise is the earnest of the inheritance of, Unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. It's, it, it, is, it consists, this wraps in God's power and promise. It's sustained. And so he gives us the sealing of the Holy Spirit. So what if some people don't believe or don't understand that? It doesn't matter. It's what God knows has to happen and what he promised. And so it's, it's on the fact of what God is going to do, his work. Man's work is no good, if you haven't found out. But God's work is perfect, perfect. It's eternal. And so understanding another part that goes with this is God's blood is eternal. God's, his sacrifice is eternal. It can transcend time. Uh, when he died on the cross, he, didn't, he just didn't die on the cross for the people that were alive at that time, presently, historically. You get, some, you, you get people messed up with different winds of doctrine. I've, heard, I've been in, I've talked to people. Who, no, he only died for the people that were there and that were alive at that time. Uh, the Bible says that it transcends time, past, present, and future. And so that's the power of God. That's why he's able to write these things uh, sealed into the, 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 with the Holy Spirit of promise, sealed into the day of redemption. So let's, let's state our fourth uh, part here. We have, we're running out of time. Here's the fourth part point if you're writing down so lesson three point number four some final thoughts so let's get into this our salvation and eternal security are based upon the absolute truth and promises of God's word you understand here's the whole basis and this is why in lesson number one we teach the authority of, of scripture if you do not believe that this bible is perfect the word of God then you've superseded this as an authority yeah. by default. It's like walking into a courtroom and not recognizing the judge or the law of the land as being the final authority. Well, you're going to act in your mind that it doesn't care what they say or what the judgment or sentence is passed. 
I, you've seen them. If you, if you watch court cases, you'll have some fruitcake <laughs> go into a, a courtroom, and he'll, he'll deny that the judge is the real judge, deny the law is not the law of the land. He'll go through a whole list, and he won't even be in relative, he won't be in reality. This is the same thing here. If you, if, you, if you deny in your heart that this is not God's word, that we really don't have God's word, then you have to understand you default to your own authority. You, the, you are the authority. And so that's how people can get away with believing what they believe other than what's in Scripture. Um, you say, well, I just don't believe that. You don't believe Scripture. It's not the person you're dealing with. You have a problem with God. You have a problem with authority. The fruitcake that we talked about, he's a problem with authority or the laws of the land. That's, that's what's going on. Never been taught correctly. So he has a, a, a distorted view of laws and authority. You say, well, I thought, he, I thought he's fine. He's not fine. He's not fine. And, and it, it's sad, a sad state. A lot of Christians are in a sad state. Uh, so we're saying, we're saying that our salvation and eternal security are based upon the absolute truth and the promise of God's word. That's what it hinges on. If this isn't real, if this isn't true, void everything that, that we teach or preach. It's of none effect. Understand? So if, if your viewpoint is the scriptures is not absolute authority, then you're going to be, you won't believe anything that it states. How can you? How could you believe salvation? How could you believe any other doctrine that might be taught from the scripture? So you have to understand where our premise is coming from. I'm, I'm coming from the premise that the, the word of God is true, is truth. So we're going to stand on basically what it's saying, what it teaches symmetrically. So we're saying we cannot let our changing emotions and influences uh, or still our confidence or cause us to doubt what God has promised he would do. God wants us to know for sure. He wants us to be confident and to live with absolute assurance. There are very, uh, various churches and denominations today that reject this very precious truth and doctrine. Their followers live in fear, never being taught that they can know for sure that heaven will be their home. Now, eternal security is not a license to sin because you have to deal with this side as well. Watch this. The fact that we can't lose our salvation does not mean that there are no consequences for our sin. Our unconfessed sins result in broken fellowship with our Heavenly Father. You say, well, do you have Bible? I, sh I sure do. And there's a whole lot more Bible on this on living a sinful life after salvation. What happens to a person? Well, 1 John 1 John chapter 1, if you want to write, verses 6 through 7 in, in, in verse 9. Our sins bring upon us the chastening hand of our loving Heavenly Father. Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, because when you get into this, you have to, you tear another part of your Bible out. Uh, you say, well, if you, if, because you have the chastening hand of God. If you're none of God's, if you can do something or have done something, I had a good friend, a good brother, and I don't mean that lightly. I, I respect this man highly and spent a lot of my life learning from him. But he did not believe in this doctrine. He was of the Wesleyan background. And so we'd get to the point of, well, what sin causes you to lose your salvation? He said, any sin that you repetitively commit, that's the sin that will cause you to lose your salvation. Have anybody heard of that? Okay. And I thought, wow, okay, so how does Hebrews chapter 12 work? I mean, in your mind, doctrinally, how do you view Hebrews chapter 12? And he says, well, what does it say? I said, well, when you go over there, let's go over there. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Notice with me verse number 5. He says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Notice the context, children and son. Uh, he says, despise not the chastening hand of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Uh, why would you get rebuked? Because you did something probably you shouldn't have, or you're not doing something that you should have. Remitical. Or, uh, okay, so he says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And I said, now, if you were not reading your Bible, let's just use that for the sin. And you don't read your Bible every day. That would be a sin. Or let's just say praying, pray without ceasing. We can just use it to a verse called 
Uh, to him to knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So we could use that verse. That's Bible. So anything that you don't do and you know you should be doing, it's sin. So if you repetitively do that, you would lose your salvation according to your doctrine. Yeah. I said, so how does God chasing you if you're not none of his? I don't, I don't know. I said, you're, you're, you're messing up your own doctrine because now you've got to take this out of your Bible or, or exclude it, you know, not, not use it. For if ye endure chastening, God dealeth, verse 7, dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, blah, then are ye, he uses the word bastards and not sons. You're an illegitimate child. You're not really his. You're saying you're a child of God, but God ain't going to chase you or fool with you because you're really none of his. And so back to John chapter 6 where we were reading this morning. All that, that my father gives me I've kept and none of them are lost. And so you think, wow, you have to have, that's why, that's why I'm saying you got to view it. And you say, what was his problem? Uh, the problem to my brother and a good brother at that, and we were able to talk about this and go on and do our business very well and even have a strong relationship. But it was viewing it through what man, how man views it, not through how God has written it. And so you have to be mindful of that. Let me say this. There are various churches and denominations that, that do not believe this. Eternal security is not a license to sin. We were looking at that. that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and 1 John chapter 1. Eternal security is a blessing by God that he wants every one of his children to enjoy. And so some of the questions that I would put uh, to my disciples is in your own words, describe the promises and the commitments that the Lord has made concerning our salvation and eternal security as found in the following verses. So I would have the disciples uh, prepare and write that down. Be prepared to discuss this with each and every one. You'll be shocked that not everybody is on the same page. You're not going to move no further in your Christian life. As light is revealed and more light is revealed, when you reject that light, you're, you're, that's, where, that's where you're cut off. You're going to stay right there until you receive that light that God gives you. He didn't, give you, he didn't go on and go on and skip that. Well, we'll come back to that. It's the same point. When you go up to that per particular light, God might be showing you light this morning. Don't reject it. Just accept the word of God. Maybe not what I say, but look at the verses for yourself. You know, it's, it's going to be the word of God. I'm going to pass off the scene. Pastor Tom's going to pass off the scene. All the other brothers and sisters before us have passed off the scene. We're here presently right now. And so it's not hinged upon us. I understand God uses men to reach men and we're spokesmen. But the spokesman is not always, in, it's not infallible, but the word of God is. It's infallible. Stick with the word of God. Let's all stand this morning. And we'll close, be close with it. If you've got any questions, we'll save them for after. Eternal security, lesson number three. Heavenly Father, we bow up and we ask you and we thank you for today. We thank you for those that have tuned in and maybe be watching. And Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, Father, oftentimes, even with light, uh, we tend to refuse what you're laying in our hearts or laying in our conscience. Father, things that we need to correct and adjust. And uh, Father, we thank you for your promises. And we thank you for the surety of what... Uh, what work you have laid down so perfectly to transcend the past and the present and the future. And we're thankful for that. Be with our day. Be with our services coming up. Be with pastor feeling with your Holy Spirit. Be with the singing and the offerings. Everything that takes place, we pray that it, we pray that it gives you glory and honor. And we thank you for every blessing that you've given us. Pray that you would look over us and watch over us 2022. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.